we're shifting in the West from a, a po political posture, which I call the politics of inevitability, to another political posture, which I call the politics of, of eternity. The politics of inevitability is the idea that says there are no ideas. It's the idea that says ideas don't count anymore. It's the idea that says there are no alternatives. History is over. Um, politics and economics are basically locked into a single format. There's only one future, and if that's true, and there's no choice anyway, you never have to actually ask what is good. And of course, that's fatal for democracy or for civil society because it, civil society pluralism depends upon a never-ending conversation about what is actually good, which is then in turn related to a never-ending conversation about what we should do in the future. What if the way we are wrong enabled the way that they are wrong? How the anti-democratic forces would not have been possible in the form that they're currently possible without what we have done. So the politics inevitability says, well, whatever happens, we're just going to roll that into the narrative progress. The politics of eternity says facts don't matter at all, right? Facts just don't matter. That we're in a world where only opinions and subjective oppressions matter. Um, the, the, the politics of inevitability says there's only one future. Right? We're all heading towards that one future. The politics of eternity takes the next logical step and says, no, actually, there's zero future. So the future is, the future is gone. And what it's been replaced with is what I'm going to call later in the talk and what I call in the book the politics of eternity, which is a kind of cyclical return to a sense that you're always in the present and one way that you're kept in the present is that you're constantly pushed back into an entirely mythical national past. The techno-optimism is part of the politics of inevitability. The internet has been making us stupid and um, it's not a coincidence. I mean, it, there's a, there are deep organic connections between the way that digital politics work and the way that so-called populism works. Unpredictability is a crucial part, and unpredictability is also a crucial part of democracy, right? The, one of the ways that democracy is being destroyed before our eyes is that we are all being made more predictable. And I'll, I'll try to return a little bit to why that is, but just briefly to suggest what, the way that digital politics works is that digital politics finds the things about you that are most predictable and then confirms those things as part of your personality, making you into a kind of caricature of yourself. Diesen Blick in eine goldene Vergangenheit, ich denke, dass das wahnsinnig wichtig ist für sogenannte Populisten, allerdings auch von links, also nicht nur von rechts, sondern auch von links, dass immer so eine goldene Vergangenheit beschworen wird, zum Beispiel als die Demokratie noch funktioniert hat, als alle zu den Wahlen gegangen sind. Aber auch Fake News sind überhaupt nichts Neues. Ich glaube, dass das immer zur Demokratie gehören wird, seit es eben, ich nenne das moderne Wahlen gibt, also Wahlen, bei denen eine relativ breite Bevölkerungsschicht mit machen darf, gibt es natürlich Lug und Betrug. Und die klugen Verfassungsväter haben das im 19. Jahrhundert auch gesehen in den verschiedenen Ländern und haben deswegen dafür gesorgt, dass Demokratie eben nicht das ist, dass einfach der Volkswille umgesetzt wird. Was ist schon der Volkswille? Den gibt es natürlich gar nicht. Sondern die Demokratie, die liberale Demokratie, wie sie sich rausentwickelt hat, ist ein hochkomplexes Geflecht, das ganz, ganz stark von Checks and Balances lebt. Und das eben nicht bedeutet, jetzt geht jemand wählen, jetzt gibt es den Mehrheitswillen und der wird dann knallhart umgesetzt. Wir leben in einer hochkomplexen Gesellschaft, deswegen ist ähm, die Bildung so wichtig. Ähm, und wie gesagt, ich denke, dass unsere Bevölkerung keineswegs so dumm ist, wenn sie recht hätten, dass wir so einfach manipulierbar wären digital, dann hätte Trump mindestens 90 Prozent bekommen müssen. Ich meine, was ist Ihre Schlussfolgerung, wenn Sie sagen, diese, diese fast totalitäre Tendenz der Digitalisierung Sagen, beschreiben. Ja, die Tendenz zur Gedankenkontrolle, zur Verhaltenssteuerung, zur Ausschaltung des Unberechenbaren, letztlich zur Ausschaltung von Individualität, die totale Manipulierbarkeit. Das hat ja fast Orwellsche Züge. Also wie, was ist der, der Aus, was ist die Antwort sagen, darauf? Ähm, so, das das finde ich ist eine der, 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 der zentralen Fragen, weil wir werden ja der digitalen Welt nicht entkommen. Die Frage ist, können wir sie gestalten und wie können wir sie gestalten und wie können wir sie auch nutzen für, für freiheitliche sagen, Ziele? This particular technology, though, has a story around it, which says that it self-regulates, that it takes care of itself. Um, and that's simply not true. The algorithms are set to do a particular thing on the social platforms, which is to connect 
your psychological vulnerabilities with someone somewhere far away who is trying to sell something. That's what they're set up to do. They can, however, be set up in different ways, which are less disastrous for thought and for democracy. And so when you ask what can be done, you, we have to get the internet in order more or less like we got the book in order. We just, we don't have 150 years to do it. So I reject the phrasing which says you're either yes, no on the internet. Of course, we're with the internet, but we're not with this internet. This internet we don't have to have. We can have a much better one.